You have heard the phrase dead as a dodo, but what if the dodo was not the dim waddling punchline we think it was? Stay with me, new DNA and bone studies recast this bird as an island adapted ground running pigeon with serious hardware in its legs and beak. In this film, we will trace how isolation on Mauritius turned a flying ancestor into a giant sprinter, why museum paintings got its body all wrong, and how a 2002 genetic study rewired the dodo's family tree. By the end, you will never look at pigeons or extinction quite the same way. You have heard the dodo was a clumsy oddball. Uh, what if its closest living relative still flies across the Indian Ocean today? That twist resets the story. For centuries, people tried to pinpoint what the dodo even was, and the evidence they relied on did not help much. Sketches were copied from sketches. Sailors' notes were written fast, sometimes after months at sea. Only a handful of carcasses reached Europe in poor shape. When you build an identity from that pile, you end up with a myth that looks solid, but wobbles as soon as you ask where the bird actually fits. Early classifications swung wide because the reference points were off. Huge, flightless, long-legged birds like ostriches and emus seemed like a neat category, so the dodo was often grouped with retites, flightless birds. Others thought cranes made more sense because of their posture in studio paintings. Those paintings, especially the Flemish studio scenes by Roland Savory, pushed the dodo into a barnyard caricature, an oversized mound-bellied creature posed among peacocks and exotic deer. Meanwhile, the primary sources from ships were thin and inconsistent, and many birds seen in Europe had been overfed like barn geese. Overfed, understimulated, and far from their home habitat, they swelled and slouched, and that posture became the visual template. The records do not agree on gait, color, or even head shape, because you are comparing a few brief island encounters to months of captive life. In European studios, artists could study a docile heavy bird at arm's length. On Mauritius, the same animal moved through thickets and foraged on the ground, but those field notes were sparse. This gap matters because the story flipped when researchers tested actual genetic material. In 2002, Beth Shapiro and colleagues pulled mitochondrial sequences from museum bones, a tarsal from the Oxford dodo specimen, and a femur from a Rodriguez solitaire, and for the first time successfully analyzed dodo DNA. That work placed Raphus cucullatus and the Rodriguez solitaire inside the pigeon family Columbidae, with the Nicobar pigeon as the closest living relative followed by crown pigeons and the tooth-billed pigeon. The label pigeon sounds small, but taxonomic kinship does not set body size. It points to ancestry and shared traits. Think of a sleek tropical flyer reaching an island with no big mammalian predators, then shifting over generations into a ground-dwelling turkey-sized forager. Same family tree, new job description. A recent analysis published in 2024 in the Zoological Journal of the Linnean Society tightened the placement within Columbiformes proposed the subtribe Rafina for the dodo and solitaire and supported an island route to flightlessness, not a distant tie to ratites or cranes. So if the dodo comes from airborne stock, the next question hits hard. Why did a pigeon get that big and drop flight on Mauritius? and how fast did that happen? This is not a taxonomic orphan after all. It is a specialized island pigeon that changed its tools to match a niche legs over wings, bulk over lift. With the family link clear, we can start tracking the mechanics of that shift and see how an ancestor built for the air became a heavyweight sprinter on the ground and what island rules drive that kind of redesign. So So how do you turn a mid-sized flyer into a heavy runner when nothing is chasing it at top speed? Islands set their own rules. With few native predators, steady seasonal pulses of fruit and seeds, an open niche space, an airborne bird can afford to downsize its wings and upscale its legs. Energy that would have gone into long flight muscles shifts into growth digestion and walking power. Flight becomes optional ground life becomes profitable.
People expect a giant bird to lumber. That assumption breaks on islands where size helps you store energy through lean months, reach more food on the forest floor and push through thickets all day. Island gigantism favors endurance and efficient foraging, not laziness. When you look across the Mascarene Islands, you find a parallel that makes the pattern hard to ignore. The Rodriguez solitaire, another big flightless pigeon on a neighboring island, evolved along the same lines, heavier bodies, reinforced limbs, and a lifestyle centered on walking, feeding, and defending space on the ground. Different island, same family, similar solution. Weight numbers help anchor what this body was doing, but they come with caveats. Modern reconstructions for wild birds often fall in a leaner athletic range, roughly 23.4 to 38.6 pounds, with some studies proposing males trending heavier than females and occasional upper estimates around 46.3 pounds in the wild. Other high figures, including 46 to 62 pounds, likely reflect overfed captive birds seen in Europe. Limited specimens and variable preservation mean these are estimates, not fixed truths. Seasonal swings likely added or shaved kilograms, with some individuals peaking during the cool, dry breeding season. Those changes fit an animal taking advantage of fruit flushes and then riding out the lean period with stored reserves. Researchers who rebuilt proportions from the skeleton, Livesey Kitchener and others consistently land on a more athletic outline than the old paintings suggest. Think about the energy budget. Flight is expensive on a predator, poor island, dropping frequent flight frees calories for growth, stronger legs, and a larger digestive tract to handle fibrous fruit rich meals. The skeleton follows the money. Leg bones show thick shafts and expansive areas where large muscles are anchored, the same architectural cues you see in birds that launch hard from a standstill. Analyses emphasize robust hind limb indices and stout tendon pathways, consistent with quick acceleration and controlled braking in cluttered ground cover. That is not a couch bird, that is a trail runner built for start stops and quick turns in tight spaces. Uh, this terrestrial design lines up with the habitat. Mauritius was not a flat lawn. It had rocky ground, dense undergrowth and patches of forest where scent and sound carried better than long distance vision. The dodos build high torque legs, a solid core and a deep gut. Fit a forager that covers ground processes, tough plant matter, and packs weight when food is abundant. That leaves the other half of the toolkit the head. To see how a ground-focused pigeon planned its roots and found food in a closed canopy, we have to read the brain through bone. If the dodo was slow-witted, why does its brain look so much like a modern pigeon's and with an olfactory twist, Researchers used high-resolution CT scans to examine a well-preserved skull and then built 3D endocasts, the internal mold of the brain cavity, to estimate the size and layout of key regions. That yields a map of the soft tissue without a single neuron left precise enough to compare with living pigeons that we already know are strong learners and reliable navigators. In 2016, work published in the Zoological Journal of the Linnean Society reported that the dodo's brain size was proportional to its body size, aligning with pigeons rather than with any reduced island diminished outlier. The stereotype says small brain, dull senses. Pigeons complicate that idea. They learn routes, remember landmarks, solve basic tasks and adapt to messy urban environments. When scientists scaled the dodo's endocast to its body mass, the result landed within the pigeon range, supporting a cognitive benchmark grounded in a family known for navigation skills, social learning and flexible foraging strategies. That comparison does not crown the dodo a genius. It sets a realistic expectation, a ground focused pigeon with normal pigeon smarts. The surprise sits up front. The endocast showed enlarged and differentiated olfactory bulbs larger than expected for a typical bird that leans on vision. On a forested island, smell becomes a shortcut to food and safety. Fallen fruit ferments under leaf litter long before it is visible. Fresh plant matter carries scent through understory humidity. 
Nesting sites and well-used paths build odor profiles. In a closed canopy where sight lines are short, relying on smell is a practical way to locate meals and steer clear of trouble without taking to the air. This sensory tilt lines up with the head's hardware. The skull is more robust than in many pigeons with a hooked bill and an upper beak nearly twice the length of the cranium. The bony nostril openings are elongated along the beak, providing space for an extended nasal passage. Paired with strong but versatile jaw mechanics, you get a tool set built for foraging flexibility, snapping soft fruits, prying bulbs, and handling tougher seeds when needed rather than pure crushing power. Add gastroliths in the gut, and the picture completes a ground forager that samples a wide menu and uses internal grit to finish the job. Think of it as a different sensory economy. Open country birds can scan horizons, under dense canopy smell and near field cues, pay off more than long range vision. The dodo's brain matches that environment. Average size for its mass, yes, but with a front loaded emphasis on olfaction that supports active searching root memory around fruiting trees and reliable returns to productive patches across seasons. Brains and bones tell you what a bird could do. To see how it lived through change and how quickly that story tightened, you turn to a place that archived its habits and hazards layer by layer. What can a fossil swamp tell you about a bird's final decades? Start at Mare Au Songe, a shallow basin on Mauritius, where bones, seeds and sediments were collected in layers that read like a ledger. It is a vertebrate concentration site. Dodo bones mingle with giant tortoise shells, reptile remains, and plant fragments embedded in peaty sands. You get more than skeletons. You get context runoff patterns, leaf litter, and pulses of drought written into the mud. The site puts the dodo back into a living system instead of a studio painting. The popular story singles out Dutch sailors as the main cause. Ma Osange pushes you to widen the frame. Sediments show episodes of water stress when the basin shrank and edges turned to traps. Animals crowded the margins to drink as droughts tightened and that crowding left dense bone clusters. Leaf litter builds up, then suddenly collapses toward the waterline, helping funnel carcasses into the swamp. Layer by layer, you see stress events stacking not a single shock. Human arrival then loaded the island with new pressures that did not leave. Rats, pigs, dogs, cats, macaques and goats spread from camps and plantations into the native forest. Ground nesting birds became exposed on multiple fronts. Rats and pigs raided eggs and chicks. Dogs and cats pursued juveniles. Macaques competed for fruit while goats browsed down understory plants and seedlings. Clearing trees around settlements fragmented the habitat and opened edges where invasive animals thrive. A bird tuned to nest on the ground and forage under cover lost both the cover and the safe ground. And while ships brought firearms, the human population on Mauritius in the 1600s was very small, likely never more than a few dozen people at a time. So direct hunting pressure was limited compared with the island wide year round pressure from invasive mammals. You can follow the chain into plant life. Large frugivores, fruit eaters, move seeds across space, pull them out, and dispersal webs fray. Work on Mauritius in 2023 shows ongoing disruption with a small set of remaining frugivores now handling most seed dispersal interactions. The Mauritian flying fox, for example, carries the bulk of that load, which concentrates risk. If one species falters, Plant communities lose both distance and direction for their seeds and forest age in place without replacement. Maro Songe locks these processes to real episodes. Drought concentrates animals. Introduced mammals strip nests and compete for food. Browsing goats and axes remove understory and cut corridors. Each stress by itself is survivable for a slow breeding ground-based pigeon. Together they crowd breeding windows sink recruitment and push adults to riskier edges where scavengers and predators wait. Hunting adds another layer, but the sites record and the island's invasive roster point to a longer squeeze rather than a single rapid cull. So the tipping point is not a single moment, but a pace problem. 
Habitat loss, invasive species, and climate stress piled up faster than a life history could repay. Egg by egg, season by season, the numbers slid until the bird vanished from the record here and reappeared somewhere else entirely. A misunderstood pigeon turns into a national emblem, a proverb and a character in children's literature. You see it on coin stamps and the Mauritian coat of arms, while the phrase as dead as a dodo leaks into everyday speech. Lewis Carroll's Alice helped cement a public image that stuck far longer than the bird did, which is a strange afterlife for an animal that lived and died on a single island. The cultural turn made the dodo famous, but fame did not guarantee accuracy. That is the catch. The caricature of a fat, foolish bird crowds out the ecological lesson written in bone and sediment. When the public fixates on a waddling mascot, it is easy to miss the ground foraging athlete reconstructed from limb strength, gait and diet. Museums and research groups are pushing back with modern exhibits and digital 3D models that restore proportional legs, tighten the torso and set the posture back into forest terrain. You get an animal that looks capable again. And once the body reads as competent, the story opens up. This was a specialized island pigeon that failed for reasons beyond slapstick. Cultural weight has practical consequences for Mauritius. National symbolism now ties to work on species that still move seeds. The Mauritian flying fox and the Mauritian bulbul carry key dispersal roles that help forests recruit new trees and protecting them is a direct response to the collapse that the dodo represents. When a few frugivores shoulder most of the seed traffic, keeping them healthy keeps plant communities functioning. That means safeguarding roost sites, reducing persecution, and making sure fruiting corridors remain connected enough for nightly flights to matter. You can see the dodo's lesson turning into fieldwork. Habitat restoration projects replace invasive thickets with native plants. Trapping programs and biosecurity measures hold rats, pigs, macaques, and feral cats down to manageable levels. Fenced refuges give ground nesters a chance to breed without nightly raids. On islands, results show up quickly when the pressure drops, seedlings survive beyond the first dry season. Bird nests fledge more chicks and forest edges stop receding. It is not glamorous, but it works because it targets the same bottlenecks that closed on the dodo. The extinction proposals draw attention, especially plans to build a dodo-like surrogate using Nicobar pigeon genetics. Companies like Colossal Biosciences have announced programs to engineer such a proxy, which raises ecological and ethical questions alongside the headlines. Scientists point out that without a functioning habitat and a controlled invasive load, a proxy bird would enter the same grinder. There is also the issue of identity. What you release is a gene edited stand in facing a climate and a community the original never knew. The caution is that simple resurrection theater cannot substitute for ecosystem repair. So the legacy lands here, not a lab made replica, but a blueprint protect habitat guard, the seed dispersers still doing the work and manage invasives before collapse. Recast the dodo from punchline to playbook and it becomes a case study you can act on now, one that frames what comes next. A flightless pigeon tuned by isolation became a ground sprinter with a strong nose, an evolution that reads like a warning label for our century. You've seen how anatomy, behavior and habitat line up when predators fade and resources concentrate. The same levers still move island species today. So your choices matter. Support habitat, work invasive control and the species that still move seeds. Groups like the Mauritius Wildlife Foundation and the Durrell Wildlife Conservation Trust restore forests, manage rats and pigs, and defend key frugivores, turning lessons into action. That is where numbers shift. That is where. Which raises the harder question, which living island bird becomes the next dodo if we wait another decade 